Prophet Ezekiel lived in a unique time in the world's history because he lived at the time of the end of the kingdom of God upon the earth. Kingdom of God which had existed for some 400 years, the throne of Yahweh upon which sat David and Solomon and their successors. And that was about to come to an end. And in its place was going to rise up the kingdom of men. That great image which is depicted in Daniel chapter 2. Those four ferocious beasts that we read of in Daniel chapter 7. We are living in the antithesis of that time because we are expecting the stone from, to fall from heaven and strike the image on its feet and grind it to powder. We are expecting the time when the, the, the beast will be judged and the fourth beast will be slain and his body given to the burning flame and the kingdom of God will be re-established again upon the earth. We read about this in Ezekiel and chapter 21 in a passage which hopefully we all know and could all recite because it just sums up the purpose of God from the time of Ezekiel to the time yet future to us Ezekiel 21 and verse 25 and thou profane wicked prince of Israel that's God's estimation of Zedekiah whose day is come when iniquity shall have an end Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, remove the diadem. That's the mitre of the high priest. If you look in the margin, there's a series of references starting in Exodus 28, verse 4, which are almost all of the references to that piece of, uh, of headgear. Remove the diadem. Take off the crown from the head of the king. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. And it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it to him. And Zechariah records that the him, the he who is spoken of here, is going to build the temple of Yahweh, and he's going to sit upon his throne, and he's going to be a priest upon his throne. And it's all going to be restored in righteousness and peace, unlike the time of Zedekiah. So the prophecy of Ezekiel has got many lessons and warnings for us. We need to hearken to it. This time, this unique time in history was a time of great prophetic activity. Three of the major prophets, <clears throat> Jeremiah, Daniel and Ezekiel, were, were all uttering their prophecies at this time, plus three of the minor prophets. And God strategically positioned Ezekiel, Daniel and Jeremiah so that his word could be heard and his will could be known. So, Ezekiel the man, he's a priest, go back to chapter 1 and verse 3, the word of Yahweh came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzai, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar, the river Kibar has been identified in Babylonian documents so we know where it was and what it was, and the hand of Yahweh was there upon him, and that's all we know about Ezekiel, he's a priest, he's the son of Buzai, that's it. Um, and he is positioned in Babylonia he's been taken captive and he's with the other captives speaking God's word to them Ezekiel would have known Jeremiah Jeremiah prophesied from the 13th year of Josiah BC 627 and by the time Ezekiel was taken captive to Babylon Jeremiah had been prophesying for 29 years and God put Jeremiah in Jerusalem with the bad figs who remained because God was still seeking to save some of them. It's possible that Ezekiel knew Daniel. He was taken captive BC 606 and subsequently prophesied in Babylon. And God put Daniel in the king's palace that he might guide and direct the rulers of Babylon and Medo-Persia to do the will of God. Daniel was one of the good figs who were taken to Babylon. He became master of the magicians. And I believe that he is the rab mag mentioned in Jeremiah. Who came with the king of Babylon's princes and sat in the gate of Jerusalem. And ensured that Jeremiah was spared. Ezekiel was taken captive eight years after Daniel and his friends. And he began to prophesy five years later. And his prophesying continued for at least 22 years. So God's put Jeremiah in Jerusalem, Daniel in the king's palace, and Ezekiel with the captives, all making known 
his will and his word. God has not left himself without witness at this critical time. So we have before us tonight the, the book of Ezekiel, the prophecy of Ezekiel. Just think for a moment. If you had on your lap a Bible that only contained 65 books, and the book that wasn't there was Ezekiel, what would you miss? Just, just think about Ezekiel for a minute. What is there about this book that we can't find in any of the other 65 books of the Bible? What's special about the prophecy of Ezekiel? Well, we have the detail of the life and of, of an amazing man who was called to be a prophet of Yahweh. A man who suffered affliction and was patient, as, as James said all the prophets did. But what's unique about this prophecy? Well, chapter 1 plus chapters 8 to 11 and some detail in chapters 40 to 48 give us the most comprehensive revelation of the cherubim that we will find anywhere in the Bible. There is far more information in Ezekiel about the cherubim than there is in the whole of the rest of the Bible. In Ezekiel 8 and 9, we have more detail about the apostasy of Judah in the times of Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin and Zedekiah than we have anywhere in the books of Kings and Chronicles. In Ezekiel chapter 20, in the early part of the chapter, we have an amazing revelation about the apostasy of Israel in Egypt before the birth of Moses, which we cannot find anywhere in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. Ezekiel 26 to 28, there is an amazingly accurate and detailed prophecy about the fate and the fall of Tyre. Far more detail than we'll find in any of the writings of the other prophets. Similarly, in Ezekiel 30 to 32, another long prophecy about the decline of Egypt, including one of those prophecies that we, we can set before atheists and say, look at this. This is unarguably true. And the Bible predicted that it would be so. And then in Ezekiel 35 to 48, some of which you have in your program for later in this year, in Ezekiel 35 to 48, we have the longest continuous section of latter-day prophecy anywhere in the Bible. There's nothing else like it. Book of Daniel, Book of Revelation, yes, they talk about the future. They also talk about many things that have been fulfilled. This section in Ezekiel is almost entirely future. In the 1970s, Arthur Gibson published in the Testimony magazine a list of 701 quotations in the book of Revelation from the Old Testament. Been through that list and 110 of those quotations come from the prophecy of Ezekiel. So more than one seventh of the, te of the quotations in Revelation that, that Arthur listed are from this one book of the Old Testament, prophecy of Ezekiel. Well, hopefully that's whetted our appetites to study it. Because those are just some of the things that, that I've found that are unique to this book. And if any can, anyone can bring any more out in, in discussion or afterwards, please do. So let's go back to the beginning of the book. Ezekiel was sent to prophesy to Israel and he was told that they wouldn't listen to him. What a start. Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 4. And he said unto me, Son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely, had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted, margin stiff of forehead and hard of heart. And keep a finger in chapter 3, turn on to chapter 33, where we have one of those little scenes in Ezekiel, where we're told that people came to him. Ezekiel 33 and verse 30. 
Also thou son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses, and speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, let us hear what is the word that cometh forth from Yahweh. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, they do them not. And when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come. Then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. I mean, how would you feel? God says this to Ezekiel, you're going to speak. They won't listen. But more than that, back in chapter 3, verse 17, 3 verse 17, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. And we know what the duty of the watchman was. He had to speak to the people and warn them if he saw something that was fearsome coming. But verse 24, Then the Spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet and spake with me and said, Go, shut thyself within thine house. But thou, O son of man, behold, they shall put bands upon thee and shall bind thee with them, and thou shalt not go out among them. So he's told to speak to the people, but he's confined to his house. And more than that, verse 26, I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth. Thou shalt be dumb, and shall not be to them a reprover, for they are a rebellious house. But when I speak with thee, I will open thy mouth, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, He that heareth, let him hear, and he that forbeareth, let him forbear, for they are a rebellious house. Pointed a prophet, yet made dumb that he might not reprove them. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ never spoke his own words either. The words that I speak are the words of the Father who has sent me. In Ezekiel chapter 4, he is commanded to portray upon the tile the city of Jerusalem and the siege that was about to come upon it. To draw the siege engines and the battering ramps. And then put an iron plate between him and the, the tile distancing himself from it while the siege took place. How would he feel about that? Knowing the temple in which he had served was going to be destroyed. And then in verses 4 to 8 he's got to lie upon his side. First of all for 40 days and then for 390 days on the other side. I mean just think how many times did you turn over in bed last night? I mean, we all know what happens. You, you wake up in the middle of the night and the shoulder hurts or there's pins and needles in the finger. or So you just turn over uh, and the symptoms go away and you go back to sleep. Ezekiel couldn't do that for 430 days. Verse 8, I will lay bands upon thee and thou shalt not turn thee from one side to another till thou hast ended the days of thy siege. And verse 9, Take thou also unto thee wheat and barley and beans and lentils and millet and fitches and put them in one vessel and make thee bread thereof according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon thy side. Three hundred and ninety days shall thou eat thereof. And thy meat which thou shalt eat shall be by weight twenty shekels a day. From time to time shall thou eat it. About ten ounces of bread a day. Four, six medium slices. That's it. No butter, no jam. Just bread. And verse 11, thou shalt drink also water by measure, the sixth part of an hin. From time to time shall thou drink, about a litre of water, minimum for survival in a hot climate. We ate that diet for over a year. How would we feel about such frugal rations? And Ezekiel's only complaint is that God has told him to bake his bread with man's dunk. Take my brethren the prophets, for an example of suffering affliction, patience. In chapter 5, he's got to cut off all his hair. How would he as a priest feel about that? In chapter 12, he's got to remove his stuff. And he can't take it out through his front door. He's got to dig a hole in the wall of his house and take it out through the hole in the wall. In chapter 24, his wife dies. But he's not to mourn. 
It wasn't an easy life being a prophet of Yahweh. And all these things Ezekiel had to do. So let's come to one of our unique sections, chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 1, It came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, we've seen from chapter 3, that's where he had to be, sat in his house, couldn't go out. As I sat in my house, the <coughs> elders of Judah sat before me, the hand of the Lord Yahweh fell there upon me. And he sees one of the cherubs of chapter 1. And verse 3, he put forth the form of a hand, took me by lock of my head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem. So he's carried in vision to the city of Jerusalem, to the temple, to see what was going on there in the temple. There at the end of verse 5 is an image of jealousy in the entry to the temple. And he's got to dig a hole in the wall in verse 8 and go through a door and he's in the holy place. And verse 10, I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. Where the cherubim should have been were all these disgusting and despicable idols and drawings. And verse 11, there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel, Every man with his censer in his hand and a thick cloud of incense went up. And they're worshipping all these idols that they've drawn graffiti style on the wall of the temple. And at the end of verse 14, there are women weeping for Tammuz, the supposed consort of Nimrod. And verse 16, he brought me to the inner court of Yahweh's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of Yahweh, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men the high priest and the 24 leaders of the courses of the priests with their backs toward the temple of Yahweh and their faces toward the east and they worship the rising sun toward the east. That's what's going on in the temple in the reign of Zedekiah. That's why the judgment fell. And the details of the judgment are in the next chapter. Ezekiel sees six men, each one with a slaughter weapon in his hand, and one man with a writer's inkhorn. And verse 4 of chapter 9, Yahweh said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in my hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. And he began, they began, with the ancient men that are before the house, that we just read about in chapter 8. They were the first to die. And we, brothers and sisters, ought to take very careful note of that. Are we sighing and crying for all the abominations that we see around us? Because if we keep a finger in Ezekiel and turn to the first letter of Peter and chapter 4, we'll find that this pattern that happened in Jerusalem, BC 586, is going to be repeated in our times. So 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of those that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? So, we're under the same pronouncement of judgment if we don't hearken to God's word. And then in chapters 10 and 11, Ezekiel sees the glory of Yahweh depart by stages from the temple and from the city and go on to the Mount of Olives and then ascend up. And although the people returned and rebuilt the temple in the time of Zerubbabel and Joshua and then Ezra and Nehemiah, the glory did not return. And the glory will not return until he comes whose right it is. And it's not till Ezekiel 43 we see the glory of Yahweh coming from the east 
and settling not in the temple that was built in the time of Joshua and Zerubbabel, but the temple that is yet to be built. And he will say, Son of man, the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of Israel forever. Let's move on now to chapter 26 and the prophecy against Tyre. One of these unique sections in the prophecy of Ezekiel. This prophecy was given in the 11th year of his captivity. That's 587 BC, which is the year before the Babylonians began to besiege Tyre. And what does Ezekiel say? Verse 3, Therefore thus saith the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, and will cause many nations to come up against thee, as the sea causes these waves to come up. And they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. Imagine a sandcastle on the beach and the tide is coming in. And wave after wave after wave comes in and it gradually creeps up the beach and starts eating into the sandcastle. And the sandcastle starts to collapse and collapse until eventually the water spread all over it and it's gone completely. That's the figure. Now, the people in Ezekiel's day would know something about this because Tyre had already been attacked by the Assyrians. 724, 720, Shalmaneser V and Sargon II. Sennacherib in 701. Esarhaddon in 671. Ashurbanipal in 633. They'd all attacked Tyre. They'd put Tyre under tribute. They'd subjugated it. They hadn't destroyed it, but they'd put it under tribute. But now Assyria is gone and Tyre is back in the forefront of trade and in the forefront of idolatry. And so God's going to deal with Tyre. Because verse 2, Tyre has said against Jerusalem, Aha, she is broken that was the gates of the people. She has turned unto me. I shall be replenished. Now she has laid waste. Tyre was boasting against Jerusalem. So verse 7, Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings from the north, with horses and with chariots and with horsemen and companies and much people. History records, the Babylonian records tell us that Nebuchadnezzar besieged Tyre for 13 years, from 586 to 573 BC. And he got nothing. He conquered the land city, he reduced it, but the inhabitants fled with all their wealth to the island city. And Nebuchadnezzar could not take that. So he got nothing out of the siege of Tyre. Turn to chapter 29 and verse 17. So this is now dated after the end of the siege of Tyre by Nebuchadnezzar. It came to pass in the seven and twentieth year, in the first month, in the first day of the month, the word of Yahweh came unto me, saying, Son of man, Nebuchadrezzar king of Babylon caused his army to serve a great service against Tyrus. Every head was made bald and every shoulder was peeled, continual wearing of armour. Yet had he no wages, nor his army for Tyrus, for the service that he has served against it. Therefore thus saith the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadrezzar king of Babylon, and he shall take her multitude, and take her spoil, and take her prey, and it shall be the wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt for his labour wherewith he served against it, because they wrought for me, saith the Lord Yahweh. So Nebuchadnezzar did not defeat the Tyrians, although he overthrew the land city. But the, the pronouns change. We go back to Ezekiel 26. All the way down from verse 8 down to verse 11, it's he, he, he. But then in verse 12, And they shall make a spoil of thy riches, and make a prey of thy merchandise. They shall break down thy walls, and destroy thy pleasant houses. They shall lay thy stones, and thy timber, and thy dust in the midst of the waters. So in BC 332, Alexander the Great arrived on the coast opposite the island city of Tyre and decided he was going to attack the island city and take it and his generals said no no it'll cost far too much time and effort we'll lose too many men 
just carry on down to Egypt, which was where Alexander ultimately was going. And he said, no, we have got to take Tyre. Because if we don't take Tyre, Tyre will have the naval dominance of the Mediterranean. We will rule on the land, but the Tyrians will have the sea. We, we've got to have the land and the sea. And so he started. He, he built a mole across from the land to the island. But they got the angle wrong and the sea swept it away. So the naval engineers did some recalculations and they built a second mole, 200 feet wide. The sea was up to 18 feet deep. It's been calculated that the volume of material that the Greeks dumped into the sea was 10 million cubic feet and it weighed over a million tons. And his, the walls of Tyre were 250 feet high and his siege engines had to be higher than that so that he could shoot down into the city. And then the Greeks got a fire ship and launched it at his siege towers and, and burnt his siege towers down. Alexander was pretty cross after that. So he got some naval allies and he got a fleet together and went round the other side of Tyre and with ships with catapults and battering rams he assaulted the other side and eventually he broke in. And he was so angry with the Tyrians for their resistance and for the horrible things they'd done to his soldiers he crucified hundreds of them on the beach and he sold about 40,000 of them into slavery. And he spoiled Tyre, the island city. Now, if you look on Google Maps, you will see that there is a flourishing island city of Tyre today, it's there. And the, the line of the mole that Alexander built out from the land is now much more than 200 feet wide. And uh, it's well populated and inhabited. There are skyscrapers on there, all standing on the sand. You know what Jesus said about in the parable about the man who built his house upon the sand? Well, they, that's what they've done. It'll all fall down when the earthquake of Ezekiel 38 happens. But it's all there. And the critics have said, well, the Bible's wrong, because the Bible said um, they will destroy Tyre. In verse 4, I will scrape her dust from her and make, make her like the top of the rock. But if you look carefully on Google Maps at the area of Tyre, just south of this inhabited area, is a barren area which is actually labelled on the map the Tyre Coast Nature Reserve and there's nothing built on it and brother Mark Taunton has carefully investigated this and he's blown all these maps up and you can see the outline of the foundations of the buildings that used to be there that is the ancient city of Tyre which Nebuchadnezzar uh, reduced and all the materials of which Alexander dumped into the sea when he made his mould so, you know, scripture is right. It is correct. The prophecy is true. Um, verse 12, and they shall make a spoil of thy riches. Well, of course, Alexander the Great did, but he wasn't the only one. Later on, Antigonus, the Greek, the Fatimids, the Crusaders, the Venetians, and, Sal and Saladin all besieged Tyre. You know, wave after wave after wave down the centuries came against this city. And today, as prophesied, there's nothing left of the old land city. Now, look at another amazing detail. Chapter 28. Here's a prophecy specifically against the king of Tyre, who said that he was a god. Verse 2. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a god, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God. Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Verse 17. Son of man, take up a lament sorry, verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle. All of those jewels are possessed by the king of Tyre. Just think for a minute. Where have we read about those jewels before? And your margin should take you back to Ezekiel 28. I'm not going to go there. But in Ezekiel 28 we have a description of the breastplate of Israel's high priest. And it had 12 jewels on it. There's 9 here in this list in verse 13. So we should be asking ourselves the question, well, 
which three does Israel's high priest have that the king of Tyre doesn't have? And the two lists aren't in the same order, so you've got to do a bit of juggling around to, to line them up. And when you do that, you find it's not random. The king of Tyre is missing the entire third row of the breastplate. Why? Because the first row goes with the tribal group of Israel that symbolises priesthood. The second row goes with the tribal group of Israel that symbolises kingship. And the fourth row goes with the tribal group of Israel that signifies judgeship. And the king of Tyre is saying, I am going to be the priest, the king and the judge. I'm the king of Tyre. I'm God. The third row is the row of Ephraim. The ox. The row of service and sacrifice. And the king of Tyre is saying through this, I'm not going to be the servant of anybody. And I'm certainly not going to give my life for anybody else. I'm the king of Tyre. Now, Brothers and sisters, young people, that's inspiration. Because there's not a hint in the text to say, oh, go back and look at Exodus 28. Or there's none of the jewels off the third row here. We've got to search that out. But God's hidden it there. And it's precise and it's accurate and it lines up perfectly. And there's a tremendous lesson that comes out of it. This is an inspired record. Move on now to Egypt, chapter 29 and onwards. We've already read chapters 20, chapter 29, verses 17 uh, down to 20, about God giving Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar as a, as a payment for his service against Tyre. Now, the higher critics of the Bible, who are coming back into fashion in, in these days, the old German higher critics of, of the 19th century, uh, their views are having a revival in, in these anti-Bible days in which we live. Higher criticism says that no history written in the Bible is believable unless it's corroborated from outside sources. So they'll read Josephus, they'll read Tacitus, they'll read Homer, and oh yeah, this is history, and accept it. But if it's in the Bible, no, we can't accept this unless we found some Babylonian record or some Egyptian papyrus that confirms it. So they reject that section in Ezekiel 29 that we've just read from verses 29, 17 to 20 because they haven't found any Babylonian record that Nebuchadnezzar went into Egypt and did these things. They cannot do that with verses 14 and 15. So we read in the record in Kings and Chronicles that Pharaoh Necho came out of Egypt with his army and went north and encountered Josiah in the plain of Megiddo and Josiah was slain. And Pharaoh Necho was on a mission. He was going up north to Carchemish to join with the Assyrians to fight against the upstart Babylonians who were just beginning to push themselves and assert themselves in the, in the Middle East. So Pharaoh Necho joined forces with the Assyrians to defeat these Babylonians. But they lost. The Babylonians won at Carchemish. And, and Necho came back with his army shattered. And then when Nebuchadnezzar went into Egypt, as both Ezekiel and Jeremiah tell us he did, he took all their spoil and he reduced them even further. And Ezekiel is telling us in verse 13, that, uh, uh, verses 12 and 13, that a lot of Egyptians went into captivity for 40 years. But when they returned, verse 14, I will bring again, says God, the captivity of Egypt, and will cause them to return into the land of Pathros, into a land of their habitation." and they shall be there a base kingdom. It shall be the basest of the kingdoms. Neither shall it exalt itself any more above the nations, and I will diminish them, and they shall no more rule over the nations. Look at the modern political world. Look at Egypt. Where is it? With apologies to the Egyptians, they are a third-rate, third-world country with no economic prospects, propped up by Saudi Arabian cash, until that runs out, unable to feed their rapidly expanding population. It is, as scripture said, a base nation, and nobody can deny that fact. The Bible said it would be. We read about all the glory of Egypt and the pharaohs in, in previous times, all gone. And the Bible said it would go, and never come back, and it hasn't. And we can add to this passage many other similar passages, 
Babylon will never be rebuilt, and it hasn't been, despite Saddam Hussein trying to do it. God says, if man can count the stars, I will cast off the seed of Israel. Man can't, and God hasn't. God said the Jews will always be a separate people. They've tried and tried to assimilate into the nations. When Chaim Weizmann got to Berlin University and talked to the professors who were Jews, they said, uh, oh, you're a Russian Jew. He said, no, no, I'm a Jew. I happen to be born in Russia. I'm not Russian, I'm a Jew. He said, oh, we're Germans. Didn't count for much when the Gestapo came knocking on the door. They have always been a separate people. God said they would be. God said he will destroy all the nations who, who overthrew them and carried them captive. Where are the Assyrians today? Where are the Babylonians? Where's the Roman Empire? All gone. Because they moved against Israel. So Ezekiel 29 verses 14 and 15 absolutely confirm that this is true predictive prophecy. Let's go now to chapter 38. Chapter 38, we probably feel we're on familiar territory here, but do we realise just how much has been fulfilled in our own times? I mean, the brethren in the 19th century talked about Ezekiel 38, but they could not see then what we can see now. So, verse 2. Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Mago, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, Brother Thomas quotes the French historian Bocart, 1640. Ross is the earliest name under which history makes mention of the name of Russia. There it is. Russia, Moscow, and Tobolsk. And verse 5. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them. It, it really is a strange alliance. Eastern Russian Orthodox Russia and Shiite Iran. But they are allies. Putin has been to Tehran. Iranian leaders are very grateful for Russian support for their nuclear program. Russia has for a long time maintained friendly relations with Ethiopia. Russia is currently courting both sides in the Libyan conflict. The generals on, on, and both the factions have been to Moscow. Russia is trying to mediate, get influence in Libya. So there's three more. Uh, verse 8. After many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword. And it has been. It's been brought back from under the Turkish scimitar and now is inhabited by God's people. <coughs> Against the mountains of Israel. Nobody knew when David Ben-Gurion stood up in May 1948 what he was going to call the new state first stamps that were printed had Hebrew post on them because they didn't know the name. David Ben-Gurion stood up and said it shall be called Israel. And it had to be because of these prophecies in Ezekiel. So the mountains are now the mountains of Israel. Which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely all of them. The mountains were waste. And see the pictures of the, the early kibbutzim. And they're almost in a desert. And a group of people standing there almost in a desert. And that land has been caused to blossom and to bud forth and bring forth fruit. And they've been brought forth out of the nations. The nation of Israel is a polyglot nation composed of Jews from all over the world who have come. And verse 12. Gog is going to come to take a spoil and to take a prey. Within the last ten years, vast reserves of oil and gas have been discovered by the state of Israel within their land and water territory. Verse 12 talks about the desolate places which are now inhabited, and they are. Verse 13, Sheba and Dedan with the merchants of Tarshish. The sunny Arab states are becoming more and more friendly toward Israel because they fear Iran. In March of this year, the Arab states got together and had a conference. They passed, passed 15 resolutions against one country and that country wasn't Israel, it was Iran. And they know what Mr Netanyahu thinks of Iran. So they're gradually getting closer to Israel. And the merchants of Tarshish. Britain has built a naval base in Bahrain in the Persian Gulf. First time Britain's had naval base east of Suez since 1971. <coughs> and 
find that if you're in any doubt at all about the identity of Britain and Tarshish, just go on Stuart's YouTube channel and find Brother Matt Davies' talks on Britain and Tarshish. There are at least eight identities there which do not fit any other nation on the face of the earth, only Britain. Verse 15. Thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts. Moscow is almost exactly due north of Israel. And you're, they're going to come, verse 16, against my people of Israel. You know? And they, they carry Israeli passports. <clears throat> and they are God's people because they are the children of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And it's going to be in the latter days, says verse 16. Well, I don't know whether you were counting, but I've just identified 17 different details in this prophecy which now exist in the earth which are there this day. It's not a coincidence. The stage is set for this great invasion of Israel. Russia is even now on Israel's northern border. And we know how rapidly she went into Syria. But only in the prophecy of Ezekiel can we find this much detail about this great northern invasion. And uh, it's good that in the class later in this year, some of these later chapters are going to be considered. We ought to be looking at this section, the longest continuous section of Latter-day prophecy in the Bible. So, finally, the temple, chapters 40 to 48. Can't do this in detail, obviously. Um, I'm not the brother to do it anyway. If you want a series on uh, Ezekiel's temple, then approach Brother Simon Griffiths. Uh, he did one at our ecclesia a few years ago, and we found it very helpful. But I just want to look at one aspect, because this is relevant to the world in which we live today. Ezekiel 42, and the angel that is showing Ezekiel around this temple uh, has his measuring reed. And in Ezekiel 40 and verse 5, we are told that in the man's hand, a measuring reed of six cubits long by the cubit and a handbreadth. That's a long cubit, about 21 inches. So this measuring reed is about three and a half yards or just over three meters long. So Ezekiel 42 verse 15. Now when he had made an end of measuring the inner house, he brought me forth toward the gate whose prospect is toward the east and measured it round about. He measured the east side with the measuring reed, 500 reeds. Verse 17, the north side, 500 reeds. Verse 18, the south side, 500 reeds. Verse 19, the west side, 500 reeds with the measuring reed. He measured it by the four sides. It had a wall round about, 500 long and 500 broad, to make a separation between the sanctuary and the profane place. And interesting, that word separation is the word divide that occurs five times in Genesis 1. God divided the light from the darkness, the waters above and the waters beneath, the day from the night. So, if you multiply three and a half yards by 500, you get 1,750 yards, which is just short of a mile. So, we have a building here that the angel is measuring which is a mile by a mile. And that's what we have in front of us if we've got an authorised version. If you've got in front of you a Holman Bible or a New English translation, it will say 875 feet. If you've got an NIV or a New Literal translation, it will say 500 cubits. The text of the Hebrew is 500 reeds. The Septuagint change this from reeds to cubits when they translated it into Greek. And several of the modern versions have followed the Septuagint rather than the Hebrew text. Why? Because they cannot see a mile square building fitting on top of Mount Moriah. So it can't be a mile square. It's got to be 875 feet square. That'll fit on Moriah. They have completely ignored the passages which talk about the enormous topographical changes that are going to take place in Jerusalem. When the Mount of Olives splits in two and the whole area is lifted up and the Mount of the House of the Lord becomes the highest place on the earth. But it's an example of the reasoning of men 
who will not take the word of God literally and at its face value and have to change it to fit their limited vision of the purpose of God. So let's not be deceived by the reasoning of man and let's rejoice in the prospect of this temple to come. So, brothers and sisters, young people, this is a wonderful book. It contains so much that cannot be found elsewhere. Ezekiel was an amazing man, as all the prophets were. His name actually occurs only twice in the Bible, in Ezekiel 1 verse 3 and 24 verse 24. He's not mentioned or referred to in any other book, but he is a wonderful example of those prophets of whom James wrote. He suffered affliction and was patient. I'd like to finish in Ezekiel chapter 24. And as we read these words, just try and put yourself in Ezekiel's sandals. Remembering all that he's gone through, being made dumb, lying on his side, starvation rations, cutting off his hair, all, all the things that he had had to experience because God commanded him to be assigned to the people. Try and appreciate how he felt. Already a captive knowing that the temple was going to be destroyed and he would never see it again. Ezekiel 24, verse 15. Also the word of Yahweh came unto me, saying, Son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. Yet neither shall thou mourn nor weep, neither shall thy tears run down. Forbear to cry, make no mourning for the dead. Bind the tire of thy head upon thee, and put thy shoes upon thy feet, and cover not thy lips and eat not the bread of men. So I spake unto the people in the morning, and at even my wife died. And I did in the morning as I was commanded. And the people said unto me, Wilt thou not tell us what these things are to us, that thou doest so? Then I answered them. The word of Yahweh came unto me, saying, Speak unto the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the excellency of your strength, the desire of your eyes, and that which your soul pitieth, and your sons and your daughters whom ye have left shall fall by the sword. And ye shall do as I have done. Ye shall not cover your lips, nor eat the bread of men. Your tire shall be upon your heads, and your shoes upon your feet. Ye shall not mourn nor weep, but ye shall pine away for your iniquities, and mourn one toward another. Thus Ezekiel is unto you a sign. According to all that he hath done shall ye do. And when this cometh to pass, ye shall know that I am Yahweh. Also, thou son of man, shall it not be in the day when I take away from them their strength, the joy of their glory, the desire of their eyes, and that whereupon they set their minds, their sons and their daughters, that he that escapeth in that day shall come unto thee, to cause thee to hear it with thine ears. In that day shall thy mouth be opened to him which is escaped, and thou shalt speak and be no more dumb, and thou shalt be a sign unto them, and they shall know that I am Yahweh. He was indeed a sign to his people, and he will be in the kingdom. May he be a sign and an encouragement to us also.